you guys are in for a real treat, not that you didn't just have one. That was wonderful. Um, so one thing that's exciting for me about this is to be able to talk to two really cutting edge investors who are doing truly different things about alternative investing. Also, it's exciting that they've never met each other before today. <laughs> so we're going to have a great conversation. So alternative, alternative investing, I kind of think about when I was coming out of college, Nirvana was considered alternative music. And now I go into elevators and I hear it on the music. So is something like that happening in alternative investing? I mean, hedge funds, private equity, feels like the old form of alternative investing. Bill, talk to me about what you, you think about when you think about alternative investing. Great. Well, thanks, Christine, for having me here. Um, you know, when I think of alternative investing, I really think of about active investing as opposed to passive investing. So I, rather than define it by a specific you know, category like hedge fund or infrastructure or, or growth equity in our case, it's really about being actively engaged and involved in the investment process, much more so than in passive investing. And I think related to that, it, it's longer term in orientation and it's illiquid uh, in our case. So that's how we think about it. But we, in, in many ways, we sort of define what we do as company building. Mm -hmm. And again, so us, that, that's just act, that's act of being actively involved in the entire range of the investment process, sourcing, company building, exiting. Yeah, but you don't you don't get in at any stage of the company's life. You you get in a particular place. You're looking for the the growing company, not the fully established company. Exactly. We're we're uh, we're our, our business is growth equity. So right. we're trying we invest in companies that are post revenue stage, typically twenty five to one hundred million dollars of revenue, and really are on the steepest part of their growth growth curve. And we're trying to help them navigate the issues of growth as they might grow from as I said, $25 to $100 million of revenue to a billion dollars. And there's all kinds of issues around you know, building management teams, building board of directors, evolving strategy, building processes and systems that are needed. And our, we've kind of built the firm to sort of navigate mm -hmm. and, and really add value during, during that part of, the, of a company's life cycle. Great. OK. All right. Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about how you see that type of alternative investing, what you're looking for as a limited partner when you're investing, and what, what's changing in this world of, of Pension investing? Um, well, I think we'd have a similar, uh, similar definition uh, of it. To give you an idea of where our business is going, I mean, a few, in 2010, we had about, um, if we draw a liquid illiquid distinction, which is not a perfect one for this, but um, we had about a little over a third, about 35% of our portfolio invested in things you would call less liquid assets. Mm -hmm. By 2020, we'll have about 60% wow. um, invested in those assets. And why is that? Um, well, a few reasons. Uh, first, we have, a, we have a very deeply rooted belief that um, operations and excellent operations are really the only durable source of value creation, so that's one. Second, um, we have a view as a long-term investor that you know, we want to be positioned on some of the big uh, tendencies that are changing the world. Um, and things like food security, things like e-commerce, things like um, uh, climate, sustainable business, stuff like that. Uh, and those less liquid assets, whether they be in infrastructure or in private equity or, or in real estate, whatever, they give us better an opportunity to be able to choose those assets uh, and therefore build the kind of portfolio that we think over the long term. Uh, will work well uh, for us. And then I guess the third reason is they tend to be, I mean, I'm exaggerating when I say this a little bit, but they tend to be a little bit more stable. There's not yeah. quite as much rock and roll as there is um, in the public markets. And for a long-term investor like that, that kind of stability attracts us. So when you're looking around for those types of assets, where do you find them? Where do you go? Well, um, I'm not sure what Bill will say about this, is, but I think you don't go to the old places. Because um, the old places... And the old places meaning? Well, the old places meaning, you know, traditional private equity, traditional infrastructure, traditional real estate, and even, it's a little less traditional, but credit. It's, it's, um, so you don't go to fund managers, or you go to the, or you don't go to the well, asset that's a, se that's a separate issue, maybe. But, um, but I think where, at least the way we see it, and God knows we could be wrong, but the way we see it is that more and more for funds like ours, um, focused on the long term with a reasonable size of assets. What we're interested in doing more and more is not actually just acquiring assets, but building businesses. 
And exactly. yeah. building businesses requires us to buy and develop platforms that we can then plug other assets into and create bigger businesses. So that leads to a word, which I think in my mind kind of expresses what we think is going on around, around alternative assets, and that's convergence, which is, I think now what's interesting is what's in between, for instance, credit and private equity, or what's in between infrastructure and private equity, or real estate and private equity and infrastructure. It's those points of intersection, it's all those things that don't fit nicely anywhere else, that that's where they're less crowded, because everything else, God, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, lining up in the Mumbai Immigration Hall when you get there at 11 o'clock at night and it's shoulder to shoulder and it's 90 or degrees. Or LaGuardia, frankly. You know, it's like everything's crowded. Um, so we try to find places that are a little less crowded and we think those things, where things converge, the spaces in between, there are interesting opportunities there. Well, and so both of you are business builders. Yeah. So that's not always what people thought well, of as investors. You know, well, investing is changing to be more about. Well, I think I I, I think um, picking up on Michael's comments uh, in company building, if you look at the evolution of alternatives and private equity, you know, in, in the in the first iteration going back 20, 25 years ago, the alpha was created through deal making and financial engineering, and I, I think that's been commoditized, and the alpha now I think is really driven by two things. One is absolutely Michael said company building, and we've invested more and more on operating resources and strategic resources to help our companies. And the second, I think, relates to saying it's not about asset class. It, it's, about, it's about intellectual capital, thematic mm -hmm. investing, really mm -hmm. getting some of the themes right. Mm -hmm. um, for us, it's about digital disruption, mm -hmm. you know, the, the shift in economic growth to Asia, and, and, and lastly, significant shifts in the healthcare landscape, which we can get into. Do you want to but, talk about some examples of, of, of where you're seeing those opportunities and in, in those particular themes you're exploring? Well, on the digital side, I mean, we we think we're in a long-term transition of the global economy towards digital, and it's happening in different countries and different industries at different paces. Mm -hmm. But over time, virtually every industry is going to be disrupted by technology and changed by technology as we become a truly digital economy around the world. And we're trying to be leveraged against that. We, we do it a couple of ways. One, we invest in technology-related companies, but also we're invested in financial services, healthcare, and consumer, all of whom are driving significant change from the digital side. So mm -hmm. whether it's e-commerce, or digital marketing in, in the consumer business. <laughs> FinTech, we've made a huge commitment to financial technology. Right. And healthcare too, we think, health, we think technology is gonna be a key solution to the cost quality problem, particularly in the developed world, uh, mm -hmm. in the healthcare side. So um, that's a, a major capability to, to be a good digital investor. You have to have strong skills around technology. We, we just hired a, an operating partner who has a background in artificial intelligence um, mm -hmm. for Bridgewater and Disney. And uh, again, that's a place for we were pushing our value add, and so that's a, that's a big theme. So you and I have talked a little bit about talent. You mentioned your recent hire, but talk to me a little bit about how you're making sure you have the right talent for what you're trying to do today as an investor. How how you're how you're finding the investment opportunities, who you're who you're recruiting from schools, and and what yeah. they're actually doing when they come in to try to help you find those opportunities. Well, we're finding a lot of. Um, opportunity by, by linking people with operating backgrounds and deep domain expertise in their sector of geography with pure investing talent, financial backgrounds. And, and, and it, it's, it's that you know, um, interplay that really is creating some interesting things. But you know, we're trying to hire you know, very highly motivated young people. And I, I look for really two main, main qualities, intellectual curiosity. Um, you really have to be interested in the world and interested in inflection points and how are things changing. And, and, uh, and, the, and the second is, um, you know, is it, you know in, in good, good intellectual horsepower. They can do those, they can really, you know, command those uh, different issues and things. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're doing some of the same things. Um, for instance, we've, uh, we've hired a lot of people who uh, don't have necessarily a pure finance background, but they're people who um, understand specific sectors who have spent lives and spent good chunks of their careers uh, working and operating businesses and understand how those businesses go about creating value and bring to the table uh, an understanding of what the vulnerabilities of those businesses may be, particularly in the face of a lot of disruptive technologies, in particular artificial intelligence and other things. So 
we're trying to branch out um, and hire different kinds of people, people who are not uh, just um, you know, experts at working at P&L or yeah. working at balance sheet. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do, which I must say is pretty challenging from an organizational point of view, because you know, the investment business continues to be you know, broken up into its silos in a place like ours where you do fixed income and public equities and credit, et cetera, and everybody has their own little place in the organization. And more and more, you know, we're trying to say no. You know, when we want to look at an opportunity, we have the capacity to play pretty much anywhere in the capital structure of a project or in a business. <coughs> and so we want to be able to bring all of the diverse talent that exists in the organization for us to so select the best way so that we don't look at everything. Because if you work in private equity, I mean, you know, if you're a hammer, you know, everything it's looks like a nail. Equity, right? um, yeah. So, and we don't, we don't want to do that. What we want to say is, no, there, there may be a better way to do this. Now, the organizational challenge that's hard about that is that's not typically the way organizations work. That's not typically the way deal teams work. Um, they work based on specialization. And what we're trying to do is to say, no, we're going to create ad hoc teams. We're going to create red teams uh, that bring together a diverse set of talent and then try to find an interesting angle. Mm -hmm. um, as we manufacture a business opportunity or an investment opportunity. So it's different, but the organizational, the organizational issues associated with doing it, they're complicated. Yeah, yeah. So do you think that your, your style of investing or your thoughts about investing are different because you come from a background at Bell Canada and the Canadian Railway? You were running <laughs> businesses? Do you think that makes you well, think a, differently yeah, as an investor? Yeah, that's a polite way of saying I may know nothing about the investment business. Um, <laughs> but you understand and, how and companies the, work, and, and if, the, if the investing business is now about managing and, companies. And that there, well, but see, that sort of comes a little bit from where I come from. Yeah. Um, because as, as a long-term investor, I think that's the kind of thing uh, that we need, to be, uh, we need to be doing. You know, there's another example um, of, of our doing something that's very operational that no, nobody else has done before, no pension fund's done before. But again, it reflects a view we have about uh, where the industry's going. I won't bore you with the details, but you know, we're, we're building, and we are literally now building, uh, a 67-kilometer light rail transit system in Montreal that'll move 40 million people a year. Uh, it's a $6 billion project, and it's, you know, people are digging stuff. Um, it's not just planning anymore. And we planned it, financed it with government, um, we're going to own it and operate it, et cetera. Um, and we're doing that because another area that we think is an interesting area is greenfield infrastructure, mm -hmm. where, again, what we want to do is we want to build a company. Right. We want to build an operating uh, platform to go and do this, not just in Montreal, which is sort of proof of concept, but rather do it in the United States. We have an opportunity to do it in New Zealand uh, with the New Zealand Superannuation Fund. We want to export that model. Um, but again, you know, it reflects a belief we have that long-term value is associated with operations. And you have to be a really good operator to create value over the long term. Yeah, and we heard that from the, the uh, guys from Carlisle were here and talking about how much of their EBITDA growth comes from operations. And you certainly see that. Your growth <laughs> equity is all about that. that. So what, what's changing at General Atlantic in terms of finding new opportunities, things that you maybe haven't always done, but where you're responding to changing in the mar changes in the market? Well, maybe a slightly different answer than, and, and again, picking up on the, the company building theme from today and, and what Michael's saying is, you know, the biggest challenge for growth companies is developing their management teams mm -hmm. and keeping pace with that growth. And, and, the, and the, the, the management team that might have gotten you to 100 million is really the team that gets you to a billion dollars. And, mm -hmm. and so we've actually invested a lot more in our human capital capability, <coughs> excuse me, to do management assessments. You become basically management <coughs> consultants, kind of. And it, it's yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's that company building that we think is becoming, you know, elemental to being successful and not successful. So we've built our own talent bank with about 5,000 vetted executives we've worked with in various capacities to accelerate the time to hire, for example. Um, and we are now feeling about one out of four searches is coming from our own talent bank. You know, we're doing management assessments, pre-investment pretty much every time, which gives us a, a roadmap to how we have to upgrade the organization and the organizational design we need to put in place. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I think you know, we're just deepening capability there to transform the companies that we invest in. And, and I'd say secondarily, just globalization. We've got 13 offices now around the world. And, you know, more and more companies, especially growth companies, 
want that help to say, look, I've got to figure out China. Help, help me figure out China. Right. What should my entry strategy be? Should I be partnering? Should I be building de, you know, de novo operations? And we've got to deliver on that value of, of helping them globalize. Let's talk about that, about the geographic uh, reach both of you have. I know I've, when I've spoken to both of you, India, China, Brazil, important markets. Let's talk about if that's, if you still see it that way, where in, you know, a lot of geopolitical change are taking place. What, where is the growth to come and how do you manage that if, if more of your investing strategy is about <coughs> sort of managing companies? You can't just give them some money and hope they. Sure. Well, it's hard not to, to recognize that you know, so much of global growth is going to come from Asia. And we feel it's, it's about 35, 40% of our portfolio is, is India, China, and Southeast Asia. And we think, you know, it, there's lots of data points out there, but you know, what, half to two thirds of global growth are going to come from that part of the world mm -hmm. in the next 20, 30 years. So I think for us, being able to be successful in sourcing opportunities and building companies in that part of the world is going to be critically important. Uh, we think China is the main event. And getting mm -hmm. China right is really critically important to us. It's the most, it's a very complicated place to operate for so many reasons. You have to have local teams. You've got strong local competitors. Things move quickly. Um, but, but that's where we're spending quite a bit of time is trying to get that right and uh, be able to really um, craft a competitive advantage in a market like that. And we've talked about how your investing strategy, because of the place and, and a company's development you, you come in, it's not things like trade aren't as essential of, a, of an input for you? I mean, most of our companies are capitalized on the domestic economy. And so we're trying to assess the health of, you know, can China continue to grow at 5 6% for a long period of time? We think they can, which is why we're so focused there. But it, it's really more driven by that than, than trade flows or, or trade policies. Okay. But, you know, what do you think, Michael? Well, <clears throat> I guess in our case, I mean, we're doing a lot of the same things. Um, India is very important to us, China, Southeast Asia. Um, Mexico, parts of Latin America. We've been in Europe a long, long time, and obviously the United States is important to us. Um, but in a lot of these countries, uh, in, take India in particular, uh, it's true for China as well, Brazil, Mexico, we, uh, we basically have a rule that we won't, um, we won't make an investment there, um, either in private equity, infrastructure, or, or whatever, um, debt, credit, et cetera, without um, a close alliance with a local partner. And the reason we do that is these countries are, I mean, every, this is true for every country, but, but countries are just very complicated places. Mm -hmm. um, and they have their own networks and, and, you know, access to information is important because, you know, at the end of the day, what's our business about? It's about a combination of information and judgment. Um, and, and that information, you have to be able to get it. I mean, we don't need help getting it in North America very much or for that matter, much in Europe. But elsewhere we do. And so if you can find the right people to work with, find people who share your values, which is like really important, uh, it's fundamental, um, then you, know, you can invest with more confidence because in some ways you know, they're acting a bit as, as your eyes and ears. Now you can't leave it entirely to them, of course, but that combination of you know, our own expertise and their expertise and their access to information and their relationships. For us, that, that's a way of, of managing the risks that are associated with going into very, very complex uh, and countries that are a little harder for us to understand than some other places. So that's been really the byword of how we've gone about globalizing um, CDPQ, which is, which, is what, which is what we're doing. And you have a very high component of your, your staff in various places is, is local, yeah. right? Well, about half of our, t of our team is outside the United States, but I, I couldn't agree more than what Michael said. The, the only way for us to manage risk and really understand the environment is by having teams on the ground who are from that geography. Right, right. And we do too. Right. Yeah, we, I mean, we, just, we actually are at a point where we really won't invest in an emerging market or a geography. We don't have a direct presence right. in the region. And, and it's, it's about having local people who can really make ju the judgment calls. That, that, so what, that are, what are some mistakes or some hard lessons you've learned? Because you've both had quite a lot of experience in very complicated investing areas. What are, you know, we have an audience of people who would like to learn. What, what is a hard lesson you've learned and how are you avoiding it now? Um, well, I would say 
uh, people have said this before, but I, if you've lived it, you really believe it. Uh, risk is the permanent loss of capital. We could measure risk a hundred different ways, yeah. but real risk in alternative investing or private equity is when you have a permanent loss and you, that you can't recover from. A mark-to-market issue, the nice thing about illiquid investing is it, it doesn't really change much if, if you mark a company down because the PEs the, of the comparables are down. But if you, you lose a company or a permanent loss, it's very, very difficult to recover from. And so, so you sort of have to make sure that won't well, happen by doing what? We, at our investment community, there's a lot of discussion about what's the probability that we could lose money on this investment. Is it 5%? Is it 40%? And, are and what, are the, what are the elements that are the biggest factors? Is it, is well, it? where we've had, where, where we, and this was maybe going to be the second part of the answer, the place for where we've had um, the most challenges and we've made mistakes, it's not been around management. A lot of people say, well, you must pick the wrong management team. Actually, we're pretty good about adjusting management teams and organizations. It's really about business model. Just certain business models that are just fundamentally unattractive and can't be fixed. Very capital intensive, low gross margin, low operating margin, uh, poor cash flow characteristics, concentrated customer base, you know, highly competitive markets. And you just can't fix those things. And I think we've made mistakes is when we've, when we've chosen to invest in those kinds of companies. Hopefully we don't do it too often. And they're not, no matter how active you are, no matter how, no matter how long-term review you have, you can't fix those things. And that's, and that's where we've, a lesson we've learned over time. What about you, Michael? Well, I, com I completely agree with that. Um, and that's well said, so I'm 100% on that page. Um, I guess I'd say um, maybe a little more, a little more personally, that um, I have two, uh, I have two characteristics, well, I have probably many, but two in particular that are probably not, I've learned, very well suited to this business. One is being a control freak. It's a bad idea in this business. Um, and it's a bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? Because you've got to give people scope. Yeah. And if you want them to use their creativity and um, to take some risk and to make some calls themselves, they've got to do it. Um, and they have to learn to do it. And your control freak tendencies need to stay in your office with the door closed. That's the first thing. Um, and the second failing I guess I have that um, I've had to learn to manage in this business is that I'm not, unfortunately, the most patient person in the world. Um, and again, if, if you really take seriously being a long-term investor, as, as we very much try to do, you have to learn to be patient um, because things take time. Yeah. And yeah. you know, building platforms, building businesses, undertaking big projects, getting them done, um, it takes time. And to get them done well takes time. So again, along with the control freak, you gotta leave the impatience in your office with the door closed um, because you gotta take time to get things right in this business. I'm not one who signs up for the view you know, I look at ads on TV for about people day trading and stuff, and I just shake my head because um, I just go, you know, like, what is that? Um, and I mean, I guess people, some people are good at it. I don't know, but um, but that's not the way we think about what we're trying to do and how we go about investing. It's different than that, uh, and it is about patience and it is about giving people an opportunity to be creative, which is, I think, going forward, as you said, I think going forward in the world. Creativity is going to become, for the, yeah, in the investment business, is going to become the single biggest differentiating characteristic. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up. I think um, you both are very creative. Thank you for coming and joining us, um, Bill Ford and Michael Sabia. Thank you, Christine. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.